And welcome everyone. I know there'll be a few other folks joining us uh, as we move along here. Um, I know also that this uh, our weather, at least in Northeast Ohio, has been kind of crazy. So there may be some folks without electricity or maybe their internet is down. So uh, we're hoping that people will, will be able to join in if their electricity comes up. I know my internet was out this morning. I was like, ah, what am I going to do? But I'm Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And we have a great program this evening. Um, it's not about birds, but it's really, really cool, cool stuff. I think everybody will like it. So we uh, usually we have our bird quiz. And you saw there were four questions for the bird quiz. Hopefully some of you had a chance to look them through and give it a try. Um, so we are going to be getting our, to our next slide, Betsy, if you wouldn't mind, please. All righty. So again, welcome everyone. We're really thrilled that you're, you are here this evening. And speaking of this evening, it is Tuesday, December 1st. Uh, of course, it's very appropriate, I guess, that we got a, a snowfall uh, on the 1st of December. But a more important thing is it is Giving Tuesday. And Giving Tuesday is a really, really important part of uh, nonprofit organizations. I know there's so many organizations that that are uh, asking for money now because oh, things are, you know aren't that great in in a lot of situations. Um, but you know, Giving Tuesday is important. Not just giving of money, but maybe even giving of time. Uh, you know, people can show their generosity in lots and lots of different ways. Um, so, so for some, it might be giving of time, maybe helping a neighbor, uh, maybe sharing a skill. But Giving Tuesday can also be giving of some funds. So, as a nonprofit, Western Cuyahoga Audubon, this is one way that we do get some of our our funding to keep going. And um, so. We'd like to, to ask that if you check out our website and there's any, any denomination would be welcome for uh, our uh, for Giving Tuesday to Western Cuyahoga um, and any amount. Any amount will be wonderful. Um, you know, we, we try to make sure that uh, we, we educate the public. We inform the, the public about uh, conservation issues, not just birds. You know, a lot of people think that Audubon is just for birds, but that's not the case. When you're thinking of birds, you're thinking habitats. When you're thinking habitats, you're thinking water, air, land. Guess what? We need that as well, too. So again, what affects wildlife, what affects birds, can also affect us. So uh, when we're striving to protect habitats, to look at birds and see the trends of birds. We're also looking to see how people uh, will fare uh, now and in the future. So again, it's very, very important that uh, our, our, we can continue on with this type of, of giving. And we thank you so much if you can give uh, uh, today for Giving Tuesday. Thanks. Next slide, please. Alrighty, let's see how well we did with our bird quiz. Uh, the first question uh, was dealt with uh, what traits do, do the nuthatches have as they're moving about looking for food on limbs and branches? Well, everybody knows this, right? You can put it in the, in the chat if you'd like. Let me see if anybody put some answers in the chat. No, I don't see anyone yet. All right, well, Nut hatches do move down trees, branches, and tree trunks head first. So, if you're out in the field and maybe you see a silhouette of a bird, you can't even tell the color, but it's moving down a tree head first, you'll say, oh, that's a nut hatch. Now, it, that we have two species of nut hatch that we can see readily in Ohio, the red-breasted and, and the white-breasted nut hatch. The white-breasted nut hatch is a bit more common Red-breasted nuthatch, uh, they're, they're common this year, but then next year, 
he may not see them at all. So, but just think, moving down the tree head first, it tends to be a nut hatch. Uh, the second question dealt with the difference. How do you tell the difference, or how do you identify uh, a common grackle versus a European starling? Okay, they're both black, uh, dark birds. You know, they're not both in the blackbird family, but they're both, both dark birds. Well, a common grackle is uh, is a bit larger than a robin, uh, lengthwise. They have iridescent blue-green head, shiny blue-green head, and, and a long tail. Uh, their beaks are black, kind of a heavy beak, and their eye is a very pale yellow color. Um, the starling is smaller than a robin, kind of kind of chubby in a way. Uh, has kind of a greenish, black, oily-looking uh, plumage. Again, iridescent, uh, but it has a short tail. Its beak is yellow, and it has a dark eye. And in the winter, the starlings, as their name implies, starling, little star, the the plumage has little white dots on it, which wear away. Uh, as the winter and, and early spring progress. And so once the summer comes along, they're in their shiny, kind of that oily, dark greenish, uh, iridescent color. So, so again, grackles bigger, starlings smaller, grackles yellow eye, starlings dark eye, grackles dark beak, starlings uh, yellow beak, and long tail on grackles versus the shorter tail on a starling. Oh, uh, the next question dealt with, well, why do turkey vultures soar in circles? Why do they do that in, in circles? Well, um, turkey vultures, as well as a few other species like hawks and owls, uh, will maximize their time in the air by using thermals, the warm currents of air that are rising from, from the earth and from pavement and from uh, buildings. And these birds will just simply spread their wings and tail and catch those warm thermals and it they don't even have to do any flapping flight it uh, uh, allows them to uh, maximize their time in the air without expending a whole lot of energy and it and it can get them very very far too so so that's that's a pretty cool thing so uh, we don't get too many turkey vultures in the winter here um, but you know, once spring comes along, um, and certainly you can see hawks and maybe owl, uh, eagles uh, in the in the winter time as you have a warming, uh, with maybe a little bit of warm uh, air, they're rising on those thermals and circling around. That's pretty cool. And our last question is was a fun question. Um, many birds, of course, with their calls, their calls uh, are often their their common name. So I don't know if any of you came up with some thoughts as to some birds that call that their calls are their are their common name. Northern Bob White is one of them. They uh, part of their call is the Bob White. Oh, it's hard for me to whistle that, especially when my mouth is dry. The Killdeer. That's an easy one because you hear them a lot around parking lots. Um, Flat, flat roofed buildings, that type of thing. Kill D, kill D, kill D, kill D. Whippoorwill is a good one too. Uh, we don't get too many of those in northern Ohio, but they're called Whippoorwill, Whippoorwill, Whippoorwill uh, in the evening and well into the night. The eastern wood peewee. There is a bird that you can get in the forest in, in the uh, spring, summer, and fall, and it, its uh, call is so it does have its uh, called its name. The Phoebe also not quite as musical, but gives its name. Phoebe, Phoebe, and the Blue Jay. Of course, I think everybody's heard of Blue Jay going J J J J. So these are just a few of them. Maybe you thought of more. Oh, and you can see the Dick Sissel too. Dick Sissels are more of an open field, uh, kind of an agricultural area bird, and they will. Uh, sing their, their uh, song, which is Dick, 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 Sis, Sis, Sis. So maybe there's a few others that you think of. So again, a lot of fun things that you can find out uh, and use uh, with, with birds. So maybe you could try those out with maybe some of your kids, see if they can 
answer some of these questions too. All right. Next slide, please. All righty. Oh, I do want to mention that we do have several of our board members present. Uh, we have Karu Savoni. Karu, you want to give a nice wave? Karu. There you go. All right. Uh, Gloria Ferris, another one of our board members. Michelle Brocious. Michelle. And I know Kurt, hopefully Kurt is on. Um, I don't know if Kurt will, have, will say hi or give a quick wave. And then a couple of our board members were not able to make it this evening. Uh, Tom and Mary Ann Romito, Amanda Sobrowski, uh, and Bruce uh, Missing, uh, not available this evening. All right, Michelle. Hello. Thank you, Nancy. Um, uh, go ahead and advance the slide, please. All right, so I am going to be uh, talking about the second Saturday bird walk report, uh, the virtual field trips, and uh, social distancing birding guidelines. All right, so um, in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, Bill Dunninger and Dave Grasskemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. The November 14th second Saturday was a sunny, cloudless day and 24 species were observed. Highlights include nine Carolina wrens, which is a large number for the Rocky River Nature Center, and 15 blue jays were scattered throughout the walk. The best highlight was a bird rescue, a golden crown kinglet, which is pictured um, there on the slide. Uh, was entangled in a prickly seed mass. They were able to free the bird and remove all the tangles entwined in the kinglet's feathers. It eventually flew off under its own power and successfully landed on a tree branch. So that uh, sounds like an exciting time on the bird walk. All right, next slide, please. All right, so last month in November, our virtual field trip was at Richfield Heritage Preserve to see woodpeckers and nuthatches. Uh, at least five participants visited the preserve throughout the month. I'm currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday. Um, I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't get, have a chance to visit the preserve last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, December's virtual field trip takes place at Sandy Lake Reservation. We will be looking for the American tree sparrow as well as winter waterfowl like the trumpeter swan and American black duck. Uh, during your visit to Sandy Lake, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, journal your thoughts, or create a poem or a haiku. Uh, send any of these items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. Uh, we will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. Uh, you can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website wcaudubon.org and clicking the December 2020 virtual field trip tile on the home page. Next slide please. All right, and finally, um, the social distancing birding guidelines. Um, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, wearing a face mask, and washing your hands or use a high alcohol hand sanitizer. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, don't you just love the photographs that are uh, along with the, the information that's on the screen? Uh, Tom Fishburne has so graciously allowed us to use so many of his photographs. Now, Michelle is also becoming a fin fantastic photographer, too. So you're going to be, <laughs> don't be embarrassed. So you'll be seeing Michelle's photos as well. Uh, I am not a photographer, so I appreciate what other people have to share. And uh, that, that Sand Hill Crane uh, at Sandy Ridge, 
Um, well, there's two of them. One of them is named, well, Kevin. <laughs> he just kind of walks around. And then there's another one that is not quite as mm, friendly. But uh, it, they're so beautiful to look at. I, I like sandhill cranes a lot. So, Alrighty. Uh, another of our board members, Gloria, is and she's also a fundraising chair. And boy, does she have a lot going on. So, Gloria, love to hear what you have to say. Okay, Nancy, thanks. Well, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, a new offering we have about junior membership. And then I'm going to tell you about our last meeting of Guardians of Nature and our Bird of Month fundraiser, and we have a photographer free winner uh, for our November contest. So, um, and this Saturday we're going to have, a, I think, a really exciting thing for young people. Um, so I hope you all uh, are interested in that. And then we're going to have one more speaker program of the year. So let's see, how about the next slide? <clears throat> So um, we've always had a student membership for uh, students that are community college or college students or technical school. Uh, we've given them a price of $20 for membership and they are uh, invited to go to all of our adult offerings that we give. Um, but this year we've decided just at holiday time, um, just in time for the holidays, to give everybody a chance to uh, buy a membership for a child or teenager who may show an interest of uh, trees, birds, um, naturalists in the environment. Uh, they might have a lot of questions. And so we're going to have Saturday sessions that will be given and there will be two age groups, 7 to 13 and 14 to 18. And um, we'll be giving programs such as uh, how to create a big backyard retreat, um, how does the topography and the land in Northeast Ohio uh, put us on a migratory uh, path, and what does that mean, and um, trying to show that instead of buying throwaway plastic, find a way to repurpose and reuse plastics and to stay away from chemicals. So we're going to have a lot of different things. We'll have speakers. Uh, why are worms important to good soil? Do they aerate the soil? What do they do? So uh, check out um, if you want any more information. You can uh, Email info at wcaudubon.org and we'll be glad to discuss it with you if you're thinking about giving it as a gift for the holidays. Next uh, slide, Betsy. Okay, our last meeting for Guardians of Nature is going to be on December 10th at 7 p.m. And at this meeting, and everybody is invited, member of WC Audubon or not, uh, can come and help us uh, kind of uh, think of some topics, um, if you'd like to present something that you're very passionate about with the environment or with uh, a creative art project or any such thing, uh, this meeting at the end of the year would be a great one to uh, attend. So, uh, Betsy, next slide. Okay, now we're coming into another fundraiser. We started in August a Bird of the Month fundraiser. And this month our um, bird is the Northern Cardinal. It happens to be our state bird. And I think there's seven, maybe more, states that have this bird as their state bird. So it might be interesting to look up and see why it's such an important bird for our area and we try to um, raise a hundred dollars a month so that we can kind of defray some of the costs we have with production of the programs, the youth programs that they will be giving uh, next year and also our adult programming and uh, we are going to have a um, 
quarterly raffle, which should be coming up soon, but I think we may hold that off to a six month because we're having a little little time gap in there to get people used to maybe just uh, sending us a ten dollar uh, gift, but you will be entered in the raffle if you do give a gift uh, a donation so um, it does help us with our conservation efforts so if you could uh, click and donate or give to um, Giving Tuesday as uh, Nancy suggested that too is another way we defray our costs of our conservation efforts so next slide please Well, now comes the time, and as Nancy said, uh, one of our board members, Marianne Romito, who is not here this uh, month, um, is the winner of our November uh, photograph contest. And I like these uh, judges' comments. When I saw this, I thought this was like, Okay, lady, take the photo already. You know, it was it was just waiting for its photo to be taken, like its portrait. And some of the judges' comments were clarity, the focus of it, the angle of the photo is uncommon, it's different. It's almost like she was down just right at eye level with them. And, the, and I love the, I dare you to cook me. <laughs> so anyway, I hope he... I hope he or she uh, did not uh, get cooked this year for Thanksgiving. So our December uh, photo contest is going to be the same bird that uh, we are using for our uh, bird of the month. So it uh, begins today and it ends on December 28th. And as Nancy says, we do have a lot of great photographers in our group, in our uh, WCAS uh, members, but you do not need a member to, uh, to enter. And it's $5 for, per photo. And you can um, enter one more than one photo. Okay, this... Saturday, this is what I was talking about a little bit before, Katie Fallon, an author, the author of Look, See the Farm, is going to give a reading of her book, and the book is about uh, two, two girls whose grandparents own an organic farm, and they uh, go to their farm and it walks you through the things that they see at their grandparents' farm and how um, all of these animals and birds and uh, are important to ecology. But also, she is going to introduce us to Humpty Dumpty, a screech owl that lives at the Avian Conservation Center of Africa. Appalachia. Um, <clears throat> this bird cannot be released into the wild because of its injuries, but um, she did a series, a talk about vultures, a black vulture and a turkey vulture that they have living at that center uh, in October. So I am really waiting to see this. And if you are thinking of giving a junior membership as a gift, <clears throat> Katie will be taking part um, in our series for 2021 for our uh, youth series of sessions. So it might be a way to sit down with your children and, and find about, out about screech owls and organic farms. And the last slide I have to discuss with everybody um, is Laura Erickson's book uh, that we will be discussing on December 13th at 7 p.m. These book discussions are really very interesting and what has been really, really nice, our authors are very open and willing to tell how they came to write the book, why 
they are interested in in the things they are and um, they really proved to be quite a good series and if you would like to look at one of the previous ones um, they are up online on our YouTube channel but Laura's book is the love lives of birds courting and mating rituals so I don't know I told Betsy that maybe that we should have had this next February but for the but I did I think it's a great way to end the year is to see how uh, birds interact with each other when they are um, looking to find a mate so I hope that um, I know it's a busy time of year it's an expensive time of year but I hope that you can uh, find time to join us for one of these great programs uh, before the end of the year and see you next January thanks so much Gloria Wow again you have so much going on well and guess what we got more stuff going on how about that so one of the things oh my goodness Oh my goodness. A um, Mitchell's ice cream gift card. You know, we've been talking a lot about fundraising. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so, yes, we are selling uh, gift cards. They are $10 denominations to Mitchell's ice cream. And there's uh, at least for Mitchells in the Northeast Ohio area. Um, what a great stocking stuffer. What a great gift for somebody in the area. Um, and look at this cute little card. It comes in this nice little packet. It's just so awesome. But, you know, Mitchells uh, is locally owned. They try to source uh, their, their products or their uh, raw products locally. Um, but they may have more than ice cream. Uh, they have frozen yogurt, they have sorbet, and I happen to like their vegan ice cream. Their salted caramel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, it, again, everything is just so good. Um, and you can see the, the you can find uh, where the store is uh, that they uh, where they sell their ice cream. But Go on to our, the WCAS store and you can purchase the cards uh, on, online. Uh, so go ahead and we will send them to you in the mail or if you live close enough, I can even drop them off to you too. So, so we hope that, uh, that this makes a nice little tasty treat for the holidays. How about that? Okay. Next slide. Yes, we had some birding challenges this past uh, fall. We had the dead tree birding challenge in, uh, in September. Finding birds in dead trees. What birds actually use dead trees to perch and to find uh, food and to whatever. Um, we had a fall warbler challenge in September and October. And we also had a, a challenge for families and, and young people, not looking for baby birds as fledglings are, but this is was for hopefully new birders, people who may not have gotten out or people who wanted to get out on the day after Thanksgiving and just see if they could find the 19 species of birds that we had on our little checklist. Now, we, why 19? That sounds kind of kooky. Well, because the 20th species was a uh, species was one that you could add to the, the list. So we had a lot of common birds. We had Canada goose and, and things like the blue jay and, and a house sparrow. So maybe you saw something a little bit more exotic, a little bit more exciting. That was your 20th bird. So our fledgling birding challenge did take place on that Friday after Thanksgiving. And we'll be doing more of these uh, in the upcoming year. Um, it may not be named the fledgling birding challenge. It may be something else. So keep your eye on our website so that you can join in on our birding challenges. They're a lot of fun. How about our next slide, please? Oh, boy. Uh, as the compiler for the Lakewood Circle Christmas Count, 
Yep. The uh, Christmas count is coming up. The 121st Christmas bird count for our circle is on Sunday, December 27th. And uh, if we could get to the next slide, I think that also has more information. There we go. We've got a lot of stuff happening besides the count itself. As you notice by these uh, bulleted points, we have a kickoff, which is going to happen on Monday, December 7th at 7 o'clock. Again, virtual presentation. Uh, it'll get people psyched up to, to want to go out. We'll get people uh, uh, scheduled to uh, take certain routes. We'll get give information on how to collect the data. Maybe you're a newer person that has not done a Christmas count. So we want to make sure that the information coming in is uh, is good and uh, and easy to uh, to interpret. So we'll get you signed up. So that is again Monday, December twenty, uh, December seventh, and uh, there's uh, registration uh, at the at the link below. Um, the Christmas bird count identification will take place on the next Monday, Monday, December fourteenth at seven, and that is going to be some of the little more challenging identifications. You know, is that a house finch? Is that a purple finch? Is that a pine siskin? Is it a, a red pole? So there's going to be some things that, that, that sometimes trip people up a little bit. And we just want to have a, a lot of fun looking at uh, and identif doing some identification of birds. And of course, getting more people signed up to take routes on our Christmas bird count. Then the count itself, again, Sunday, December 27th. Um, you can go to the website and see the map where our uh, count circle is. It's called the Lakewood Count Circle. Um, we have a lot of the lakefront. We have uh, uh, part of the west side of Cleveland into Brooklyn, Parma, Parma Heights. Our count circle also goes all the way, uh, actually over the border into Lorain County, just a scooch and then down towards well, approximately where the turnpike, where I-80 uh, goes through. So Strongsville, Berea, Olmsted Falls, Olmsted Township. So we have that happening. And then uh, the uh, after Christmas, oh, uh, it will be on Monday, uh, January 11th, we will have our wrap up. We'll go through the list, see what, what, what people have seen. We'll take a look at photographs. People will t share their stories about being out that day. So this should be a lot of fun. Normally in the past, we've had a uh, Christmas bird count dinner where we kind of went over the, the checklist and, and got a chance to, to chat with everyone. But uh, of course, we can't get together this year. So um, the wrap up will be a, a lot of fun uh, again joining virtually. So again, there's 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 something good about being uh, online and virtual where everybody can get together safely. Next slide, please. All righty. We're getting down to getting closer to our program, folks. But I did want to mention next month on Tuesday, January 5th, uh, we have John Hannon from BirdLife International, the U.S. representative to BirdLife International. He's going to be talking about bird migration, linking the, the habitats between two continents. Because as we know, uh, a lot of our birds, the birds that we see here in the spring into the su and maybe nesting throughout the summer, uh, they spend most of their time either in Central or South America. So, so it's going to be a very, very important uh, uh, talk to look at both the northern hemisphere for, and the southern hemisphere. These are birds of two worlds. And so I'm, I can't wait to have uh, Mr. Hannon from BirdLife International share his, his uh, uh, observations with us. But this evening, ooh, I've got a show and tell. I've got a stick. I've got a stick with some, some things on it. Look at that. What the heck is going on here? Anybody see those things on it? They're kind of blue-green, kind of crunchy looking. Lichens. I like lichens. And I absolutely love the presentation that we're going to be having 
with uh, Thomas Curtis, a botany student at Kent State University, who is into lichens, or if, in, if you're in Europe or you're in Britain, it's lichens, isn't that right? <laughs> but this is, this is so fun. I got this before the snowfall, so no, I did not dig through the snow to find the lichens on this branch. So um, I cannot wait to, to hear what Thomas has to share with us about about lichens and uh, the research he's doing with the um, uh, uh, the uh, Portage Park District. So Tom, Thomas, take it away, please. We're, we are so thrilled that you're here. Yeah, sounds good. Looks good. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Well, so. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, I should mention that if you guys have any questions at any time during this presentation, you can feel free to leave a chat or just speak up. So today I'd like to present to you guys kind of my work, the work of me and my colleagues uh, of the, lichen, the study of lichens in Northeast Ohio. But before I do that, I understand that some of you might not be entirely familiar with what lichens are. So I'll go over kind of the basics here. So lichens, the term lichens, kind of refers to a lifestyle. It's a polyphyletic term. So lichens do not share taxonomy. They just share the lifestyle of a fungus in symbiosis with an algae. And that's often what people are familiar with, uh, whether they've taken a kind of uh, introductory biology course and have been just introduced briefly to lichens. That's kind of their view. But they're not that simple either. And for lichenologists to kind of fill in the gaps of the taxonomy to make it more um, modernized, I guess, with uh, phylogeny being so important in modern uh, systematics nowadays. You hear this term a lot, lichenized lichenicolus and allied fungi. And that kind of fills in all the gaps of the otherwise polyphyletic term that is lichens. So lichens can be lichenized loosely or strictly. Strictly, the fungus is producing a, is, is basically giving back to the algae. Um, it's a legitimate symbiosis where the, the uh, algae provides the food for the symbiote um, through photosynthesis and the fungus will in turn produce shelter. It'll protect algae from UV radiation. And uh, it can, the algae can survive in the form of a lichen in uh, places that it would not be able to free live. And this would be an example of a strictly lichenized fungus or a lichen that's lichenized in a strict sense, thought of as the corals of terrestrial environments. But it turns, it turns out that lichens, not all lichens, have this kind of cool symbiosis. Some of them, the spores just land on a, a colony of algae minding its own business, and it parasitizes it, starts eating it. This is hardly a symbiosis. This is, but there's still an association with algae and fungi. So these are considered lichens kind of in a loose sense. Then lichenicolus fungi are lichen parasites. So they're fungi that parasitize lichens. And basically, lichenologists study these species because if we don't, no one else will because they're only found on lichens. So if you're not looking at lichens, you're not going to find these lichen parasites. And then allied fungi contain are just the groups kind of the castaways. They're the species that aren't lichenized, but they share taxonomy or close phylogeny with lichens and are therefore grouped in with the study in order to fill in those gaps in the taxonomy. 
And the important thing to recognize here is that a lot of these lichen parasites, allied fungi and um, loosely lichenized fungi are not really studied by any other mycological discipline. So it's important to include all these in lichenology so that they can all be studied and given ample attention in taxonomy. Next slide. So lichen forms, I'll go over some of the basics here. Um, two major forms is the macro lichens, the ones that are like clearly visible, they're three-dimensional, and then there's the micro lichens that form kind of crusts over substrata. And these species are often microscopic and can only be really seen with magnification or at least recognized under magnification. And not surprisingly, they're the species that are most neglected in lichen taxonomy. But macro lichens are even further divided into three main subcategories based on morphology. Um, the folios, which kind of radiate and produce lobes. They have a undersurface and an upper surface clearly defined. And the squamulose lichens are similar, except they are more like scales almost. And then the fruticose lichens, they don't really have an upper surface or undersurface to their thalli or their bodies. They are just kind of have branches. They're composed of branches that all converge at, an, at a, a single point or umbilicus. Um, this slide is here to kind of demonstrate just how variable lichens can be. On the upper left here, you have a fully aquatic lichen called Peltigera hydrotheria that lives most of its life completely submerged underwater. And then you have, at the bottom left, you have a, a desert of a Telochistes lichen growing where water is extremely scarce. In the center, you have a variation in morphology. You have this lichen in the up, upper center photo that is very three-dimensional, branching. And in fact, it can even break off and roll around in the desert like a tumbleweed. Um, it's called Xantha permelia coloradoensis, I believe. And then in the bottom center, you have a lichen that's so flat and uh, attached to the substrate of the, that the hyphae, which are the body of the lichen that isn't those discs that you're seeing, is actually within the rock. And you can't really see it. it it'll only form a, a cast in the substrate. So it's very, there's incredible variety in form. And then size comparison in the right two photos. You have a lichen that can drape and cover the canopies of trees. It'll be, you know, 10, 20 feet long per strand. Grows actually quite quick. And then at the bottom, you have a lichen that's so small that the fruiting structures are barely a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, and you can kind of see them there on, you can actually see the grains, the uh, individual cells that make up the wood. That's how small they are. So it's incredible variety. So why are lichens important? Well, they represent a major unrecognized component of terrestrial biodiversity. And they comprise a huge portion, a considerable portion of the biodiversity in any given area, in any given healthy ecosystem. They are known to provide medicinal uses. Um, in fact, there's a whole study is ethnolichenology that is devoted to learning about the medical uses that lichens can provide. They produce secondary metabolites found nowhere else, and they produce dozens of these complex organic metabolites that um, they produce as byproducts of their metabolism. But um, 
they, they, the substances can be found within their thalluses. They can be uh, extracted, and, and they have all kinds of purposes for medicine, like I previously mentioned, and also purposes that may not be known because not much has been studied about them. They provide food and shelter for new, numerous organisms. Um, several bird species use them as nesting material, but also um, insects, uh, some uh, mollusks, and all the way to caribou use them as food um, as a uh, means of photosynthetic material. Shelter, a lot of uh, smaller organisms will use lichen thalli for shelter. They also provide numerous services for the ecosystem, including nitrogen fixation, water retention. They actually do this cool thing, especially where lichens, the biomass of lichens is prevalent in an ecosystem, such as the Smoky Mountains. They will soak up water after a rain, and they will slowly release it into the environment. And because of this role that lichens play, um, a lot of species that are, need moisture there all the time, almost like a tropical habitat or subtropical habitat, only persist because these lichens are playing this role in environments. And lastly, they indicate habitat health. Um, they're often the first and sometimes the last things to disappear um, due to various disturbances, whether it's to the air, um, the water, the disturbances in uh, cutting down of forests and um, developing areas. They're often the first to leave. So I'll, the, I'll, I'll begin to narrow my um, focus here. Ohio has a generally a pretty distinguished um, history of lichenology. There's a number of lichenologists that have come from Ohio that have submitted uh, great works, not only for Ohio lichens, but for lichenology in general. They've um, contributed a lot. But this being said, most of the attention has been given to macro lichens. Um, the, while the micro lichens and the other lichen parasites and allied fungi have been largely overlooked. And the concerning thing about this is micro lichens and these allies can comprise over 60% of the diversity of lichenized lichenicals and allied fungi in any given ecosystem. And the 60% is actually a pretty common number. It can be much higher. It's rarely less than this. The other uh, unfortunate thing about concerning the history of Ohio lichenology is that a lot of collections are inaccurate or they're very hard to make accurate just because of the vast changes in our understanding of lichen systematics. And for this reason, a lot of the historical collections can't really be included in uh, our modern understanding of lichens. Oh, another concerning thing is that only macro lichens have been proposed as species at risk in Ohio. So even though macro lichens comprise about a third of the lichen diversity, they're the only species that have been given any attention as species at risk. And I can be the first to tell you there are plenty of micro lichens that are rare and uh, would warrant some sort of legislative protection. So a synopsis of my study, it's been going on for about the last four years, um, been taking place in Northeast Ohio as defined by the 13 counties in the lower left photo, uh, picture. And it's been an independent study. It's not necessarily tied to any particular organization, although many organizations have been helpful. And I don't include older records because of the inaccuracies that I described in the previous slide. The purpose is to expand and revise the understanding of lichens. 
um, and to increase representation of lichens in herbaria, and that means is basically going out and collecting species and and providing the first kind of tangible representation of what lichens we have in Northeast Ohio in any given area. And also just to raise awareness and help implement legislation to protect lichens. That's kind of the ultimate goal, is the protection of lichens, um, given a greater understanding. Some of the major accomplishments, uh, believe it or not, there are now 433 recognized species that have been seen within uh, the last four years and noted in Northeast Ohio. 118 of these species are new to Ohio or even to North America. 11 of those 118 new species are macro lichens, which, if you remember, are the more, have been studied much more than micro lichens in history. But still, 11 new species have been found in the last four years. Um, greater than 20 additional species are undescribed and are not included in that uh, 433 recognized species. Um, a lot of these species, I don't really understand what they are. And then others, I know for a fact they're undescribed. Some of them are try I'm trying to currently describe. Um, but some of them are just really confusing to try to understand. <laughs> and then uh, lastly, we have, me and my colleagues have been able to contribute somewhere around 3,500 to 4,000 specimens, so tangible representatives of these lichen species in an herbarium, most of which are in the Kent State University herbarium. So lichen diversity in Northeast Ohio, kind of this slide is going over what that 433 species number is comprised of. There's 152 macro lichens, and there's 237 micro lichens, 23 lichenicolus and allied fungi, and I mean 23 lichenicolus fungi, 25 allied fungi. And if there are any of you that are very good at math, you'll notice there was a four species overlap. And that's because some species actually begin their life as a lichenicolus fungus or lichen parasite and become lichenized, whether they adopt the photobiont of the uh, lichen they began parasitizing or they just uh, take up the uh, algae and begin incorporating that into their thallus. Um, it's quite remarkable. So I guess uh, th that all being said, I'd like to just go over some of the most exciting finds um, that have been found during the study um, of the recognized species. While the undescribed species are exciting, they, you know, I don't, I don't really want to include them here yet. The first one, Abscondatella delucula. It's a very tiny lichen. You can see the, the millimeter bar. It's extremely small. This one was found on a granite boulder in Cuyahoga County. And this is the only record of this species in Ohio. And I believe only record outside of the Smoky Mountains of North America. So it's quite a remarkable disjunct. Agonimia gelatinosa, this species has an interesting story. It was found twice um, within the same week in Geauga County, both, both locations within three miles of each other. And it hasn't been seen since, was never seen before. Both of the sightings were on a rather strange substrate. While it's mostly known on soil, both of these sightings were on rock. So it was kind of an oddity. It might represent a whole new species of agonimia, but for now, agonimia gelatinosa is what it is most similar to. 
Arthonia granosa, and I have this in quotes because this is probably what it is, but it's it may or may not be Arthonia granosa. Basically, Arthonia granosa is known from two other collections from the 1960s in North America, uh, two of which were uh, both of which were from Minnesota. And it turns out that it's not actually that rare within the last year or so. Maybe 11 new sightings in Ohio alone have been found, and then several from Ontario um, by some of my colleagues, which, is, you know, that just goes, kind of illustrates how under overlooked and understudied these organisms are. Bats of Dina Arnoldiana, this, I believe, is known primarily in North America from the Pacific Northwest. So it being found in Ohio is quite a remarkable disjunct as well. This species, th this photo in the uh, right shows it on a log. You can't really see it from the picture because it's almost microscopic, but that's where it was growing. That was at Liberty Park in Twinsburg. I don't know if any of you have been there before, but it's a beautiful park, very large. It's probably a good spot for birding. Ceruleum hepii. This is uh, an intriguing record from Geauga County again. It was found growing on um, some treated wood in a plant nursery. This is the only record of this species growing on something other than limestone. So maybe some sort of chemicals they were putting in the fertilizer made the substrate more conducive to calcophiles, but this species was growing quite abundantly there, and it's relatively rare throughout its range. Calplaca ulcerosa is known only from the Midwest, and by Midwest I mean a couple states west of Ohio, except for this one location here in Ohio where it, it's new and it's only known from the tree you see on the left photo in Ohio. I mean the right photo in Ohio. And that is at I think Blair Road Park in Lake County which is a really awesome park. There's some amazing uh, shale cliffs. Uh -oh. Okay, next one. Catalaria fungoides. This species was new to North America um, it was found first at uh, in one of the parcels of the Dew public hunting area in Geauga County. And it's very, very, it doesn't look like a lichen. It looks more like a algae, which is probably why it's been overlooked for so long. But uh, I looked into it a little more, and it turns out there are other collections from um, a good... Uh, uh, one of my colleagues, James Lindemar from the New York Botanical Garden, he had collected this a few times in the Smoky Mountains, and then um, we kind of realized together that this is what all these collections are, and it turns out it's not actually that rare in North America, um, despite being overlooked for this so long. Gyolidiosis mudiae, this is one of my favorites is actually described from a tire rut in New Jersey, and it, it grows on soil. This one was found at Shaw Woods in Portage County, um, in a, along a right-of-way where there's exposed sandy soil that is kept open by the power companies. And um, that this right-of-way contains a whole host of rare species, but this is one of them. I think since it's been found elsewhere in Ohio, but regardless, it's very rare. It was, at one point, it was thought to be very narrowly restricted to the northern apt Appalachians, but it's since been realized to be more widespread. Hypotrichina afro-revoluta is, again, the species was thought and is probably quite restricted to the Appalachians, except for one weird disjunct at Shaw Woods again in Ohio, in Portage County, uh, it was just found growing on a dead cherry limb, and it's probably over 100 miles from the nearest collection. 
Japuiella dolly partoniana. This is kind of an interesting species. It is named after Dolly Parton. It is described from the Smoky Mountains. And um, this, this, these records are new for Ohio. It's really nondescript, except for the chemistry. If you drop a drop of uh, potassium hydroxide on it, it'll start turning bright red, and that's because of a reaction with a substance called norstictic acid that it produces that's quite unique. Um, other than that, it's not very uh, remarkable in any other way. It was found, I believe, in Big Creek Park in Geauga County, I think. Whichever one has the floodplain of the Chagrin River going through it. Menegazia subsimilis. Um, this species was thought to be extirpated from Ohio because the most recent collection was in 1877, and it was since thought to have disappeared, like many other lichens have, almost certainly due to disturbance, uh, until it was refound at West Branch State Park in Portage County. Unfortunately, it was found on a already fallen log on the edge of a power line right away, and it, that population does not exist anymore. But then I, I found it again at Crane Hollow. So the only existing population um, of this quite beautiful lichen is on this chestnut oak in some one of the hollows in Crane Hollow, which is in Hawking County. This is the only tree. Multiclavia lavernalis. This is the another rare lichen that was found in the Shaw Woods right of way in Portage County, growing very close to the Gyalidiopsis. This species is an example of a basidio lichen, and they're kind of unique because they produce mushrooms. But they're still lichens because the fungus is growing with the algae in a symbiosis, quote, symbiosis and these kind of club-shaped mushrooms that are kind of orangish and really actually quite pretty uh, will grow out of the algae colonies in certain times of the year. Muriolecus carlotiana. This species was described from Ontario in a similar ledge system. And these ledge systems are very specialized in they have sandstone that has groundwater that seeps over them and produces kind of a calcareous influence, but not super calcareous, just slightly basic. And in these habitats, a whole host of rare lichens will grow, including this species. And this is the only record of it in the United States right now, or anywhere north, north of Canada. It made the jump. This was at Beaver Creek State Park in Columbiana County. This is a beautiful park with all kinds of nice ledges. I highly recommend going there. Myrionora albedula. This is one I actually pretty recently found, maybe a few months ago. It was in the Grand River Terraces in um, Ashtabula County, which is a property owned by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And this species is extremely tiny, but uh, it has interesting uh, anatomy. If you section the apothecia, which are those discs that you see in the picture, and examine the spores are very unique um, amongst other lichens. And this is maybe one of three locations in all of North America that is, is known to the species. It's very, very very rare, and I believe it was only described based on a single specimen, since been found maybe once or twice other than this uh, population. This is Rhinodinus wauxiana. This was growing very closely to the Myriolecus at Beaver Creek State Park. It's another, um, it likes the, the uh, slightly basic uh, sandstone cliffs and is quite rare throughout its range. This 
it was kind of a cool two-for-one deal. This protopermelia hypotremella, which are these kind of pale granular lumps that you see in the picture. That's the lichen. And it's very small and it's kind of like, it's kind of hard to like tell what's going on when you're looking at it, but it's, it's forming these granules over the bark. And, but it also has a lichen parasite that only grows on it. So when I found Protopermelia hypotremella for the first time in Ohio at Thompson Ledges in Geauga County, I went looking for this parasite and I ended up finding it too, which is kind of cool. So both of those are only known from Thompson Ledges, which holds a whole host of other rare species that only grow there or grow, grow very few other places. Sporangiospora moriformis. This is another species that is diagnostic due to the uh, microscopic anatomy of the apothecia. It grows in floodplains and um, was, I first found it at Mohican State Park and then I found it in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So now it's known from those two locations in Ohio now. It's known to be quite rare throughout its range. Uh, same with this Thelocarpon intermediellum. So this is found at two places, both somewhere near the banks of Magda Reservoir. It is not known from anywhere else in the state. Ustia dazia this is kind of a cool looking species. It was found at West Branch State Park for the first time in Ohio. It's only common in the Ozarks and elsewhere in Eastern North America, it's quite rare. Um, and it's distinct from other beard lichens because it's a lot, it has a lot more spines on it. As you can see, it's really spiny and that's kind of unique. Vegdea schuylerina. This species actually has a Wikipedia page, I believe, and it says something like it's only known from one place um, in the world, and that's somewhere in Philadelphia, but actually that's not true. Um, it's been found a few other places, including a few places in Ohio. I first found it along the Lake Erie shore in Ashtabula County, and I've since found it a couple other places, including the Cuyahoga Valley, and I believe Sean Pagoshnik just found it somewhere else in southern Ohio, actually. And um, it grows on exposed clay soil. That's kind of its niche, along with some other inconspicuous bryophytes. So with that, I would like to thank all these organizations that have helped make my study possible and uh, me and my colleagues, what we've accomplished uh, we owe these companies a great deal. And with that, I'll leave this resource page open for anyone who's interested in looking into lichens further, and I will, uh, ex I will answer any questions that I can get, if there are any. Wow, wow, wow. Who knew all this wonderful stuff about lichens. I knew some of the basics, but there's a ton of stuff. First of all, thank you so much. Yeah, and there no is problem. a question. There is a question that has come in. Uh, are these uh, lichens ID'd in the field or in the lab? And also, do you identify the fungal and algae components separately? Um, so, it really depends on the kind of, some lichens are easily identified in the field and other lichens you have to take back and examine the microanatomy and you can get away with a lot of just um, field IDs just by having experience, same with everything. Um, and what was the other question again? Um, do you identify the fungal and algae components? So most, most lichenology, most of those names I was telling you guys, those are 
referring to the fungus. And the reason why we kind of stick to the fungus is because many lichens can use the same algae or the, uh, one particular species can use several algae. So the constant is the fungus. You can identify the algae. I never really go past genus just because it doesn't, I don't know, I guess I'm not really interest, as interested in identifying the algae. But um, most of the algae are, are studied by uh, algae specialists and, I mean, are found often free-living outside of the lichen in their uh, particular habitats, mostly humid, dark areas. So, yeah, hope that answers that question. <coughs> I have I have a question, Thomas. This is Gloria Ferris. Um, you're finding rare lichens in Northeast mm -hmm. Ohio. You said that there was one that you found that had only been in the Ozarks, a few in the Smoky Mountains, and then the one that Philadelphia has claimed, and you say it's also here. Right. Do you think... They have always been here, but because uh, no one was looking, they weren't found? Oh, yeah, kind of or do you think there's a progression of going from, like, the Smoky Mountains northward to Ohio? Or what, what makes you, how do you think that is? Is there a progression, or do you think they've always been there and they've been overlooked? Yeah, I mean, it, without a doubt, a lot of these species have been here the whole time, and they've just been overlooked. Um, that's one of the exciting things about, and that's what it kind of drew me into lichenology, is just how much that I can find that's new just by looking in, like, literally my backyard. Um, but, yeah, they've definitely been overlooked. I mean, you got to kind of think, we're, lichenology is way behind some of the other biological disciplines. So it'd be like a birder getting off in, we're still in New England and Boston, you know, when they're just starting to survey things in North America. That's kind of where we're at as like an ologist. So yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. A question came in. Uh, how do you prepare herbaria specimens uh, for lichens? Yeah, so lichens are really easy. Um, actually, I have a bunch of packets right here from the last survey survey I did in a Hawking County property. I mean, I literally just took a piece of bark and put it in a paper packet. And I, I have all the information the locality substrate information online and I'll print out acid free kind of special packets later. But um, as far as collecting the specimen, you don't have to press them like plants. Maybe sometimes you do if they're like really branching and enlarged. But most of the time you just take a piece of it and they preserve very well as long as you dry them and uh, um, sterilize them in some way, whether it's chemically or through ultra freezing. How about specimens that are not on wood or a piece of bark? What, what about on a hunk of rock? You have to actually yeah, I have rock at chisels. A... Okay. I take my rock chisels out and I chisel pieces of the rocks off to, uh, yeah, I mean, the only way to get it in herbarium, a physical specimen, is to take a piece of the substrate. A lot of times the lichen is so closely adhered that there's no possible way to get a identifiable specimen without just taking a chunk of the substrate with it and using that as representation. So. Mm -hmm. it, um, are lichens eaten by other organisms and even by humans? Oh yeah, I mean uh, definitely by other organisms. I see the most common kind of uh, browse on lichens that I see are from snails and slugs. But a lot of insects do it, and all the way to um, macroinvertebrates like caribou. Caribou depend on lichens 
um, to provide a primary uh, source of photosynthetic material in months where plants are not photosynthesizing. Um, but humans definitely also, at least at some point in our history, um, use lichens as a major source of food. Most are definitely edible. Have you ever eaten one? Uh, I think maybe I have, but they're not super tasty, so I don't make it a habit. So we're not going to so see you chomping on, on a piece of lichen on a rock. <laughs> no, no, not me. Maybe someone else. <laughs> maybe if I was really I, uh, desperate. Yeah. I mean, right, they it, occur it, in habitats where a lot of other things don't. So for that reason, a lot of organisms do depend on them as food, So, which is kind of cool. I mean, they're in Antarctica. Yeah. They, I think they comprise most of the macro biodiversity in Antarctica, along with mm -hmm. a few mosses. I don't think any vascular plants grow in Antarctica. I could be wrong about that, but... There's certainly more lichens. Cool. Uh, if someone is just beginning to observe lichens, uh, what are some tips for a beginner? Um, so I started, there's actually a, on the, the bottom left photo of the screen, there is this book, Common Lichens of Ohio, Field Guide. It has amazing illustrations that were taken by Bob Clips. It was written by Ray Showman, who's been a great mentor to me. And a lot of these people are uh, perfectly willing to reach out and help. The Ohio Moss and Lichen Association is probably the best go-to, um, not only because of the expertise that is um, freely available and it, uh, everyone in the association is very willing, but also because of the uh, online resources. I actually uploaded a key to all the Northeast Ohio lichens, so you can use that, although it is pretty technical. So if you're beginning, I would start with something like this Common Lichens of Ohio Field Guide that I believe the ODNR published. So. Yes. How, how did you begin, by the way? I began uh, studying lichens as an arborist, actually. I was a tree climber. I'm not a tr I don't climb trees a whole lot anymore, but for uh, trimming. And I was, me and my friend, we, had always, uh, we were always interested in nature. And I think what drew me to lichens in particular is how little I knew about them previously like I didn't even know that they were a symbiosis I didn't even know that much um, I just thought they were like mosses I, I didn't know the difference and I think once I realized how little I knew I just dove right in wonderful all right uh, there was uh, one final question uh, are there lichens that might be dangerous to ingest uh, just like there are some poisonous mushrooms yeah, I mean, there are lichens that produce secondary metabolites that are actually antibiotics, which, I mean, basically means they're poisonous. And I believe there's a, a lichen called a wolf lichen. It doesn't occur in Ohio. It's Lotharia. There's two species, Lotharia vulpina and Columbiana, and both of them produce a secondary metabolite. I can't remember what it is, but it's poisonous and they used to feed it or somehow put it in bait for wolves and the wolves would eat it and then they would die because of the lichens were in it. So there are certainly some lichens that are not safe to ingest, but most of them are. Certainly most around here. Wow. Again, this was fascinating. I learned so much. I'm going to grab my by ODNR or Common Lichens of Ohio and start paging through it. And once the Great. snow melts, although I can look at them um, on branches and stuff like that too. Um, yeah, this, this is terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the, the, uh, I, how about a nice round of applause for, for Thomas? That was great. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right.
and you have a good holiday, and I'm going yeah, to wish too. a good holiday to everyone. Uh, so, and we'll hopefully see folks uh, sign up for the Christmas bird count and some of the activities uh, surrounding that. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.